Let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Pray as always, Father, that this message is a message that you have for your people. Father, may the proud amongst us be humbled, but the humble lifted up. In the name of Jesus, amen. So uh, because the sermon, I know, I, I understand that Linda just read this, but they cut this sometimes to do sermon-only stuff for those people online. So I do want you to open up the Bible. I'm going to preach on the epistle lesson for today. So please open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 19 to 26. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 to 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 19 to 26. First Corinthians chapter 15, 19 to 26. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. We're going to stop right there. Today is Easter. It is the highest festival of the entire church calendar. A lot of Christians, Christians no less, uh, the world does not consider Easter uh, the highest festival. The, the whole world considers Christmas the highest festival. But sadly, many Christians consider Christmas the highest festival. Christmas is important, amen? But this is it. This is the deal. This is the highest festival of the church calendar. And you know what's sad? Many Christians in America do not understand why this is their highest festival. And that is very sad. But I'm going to tell you why a lot of American Christians don't understand it. It has to do with our understanding, really, our worldview of life. Our prosperity in America, our expectation of health and protection has made us miss the reality of the world and how important today really is. Jesus rose from the dead. What happened? Jesus died on the cross. His spirit left his body. He's God, so he was both with the thief in paradise, but also proclaiming victory in hell. His body was placed in a tomb, and his body began to rot and decay like all dead bodies do. Then early on the third day, the first day of the week, that spirit, his spirit, re-entered that dead, decaying flesh. That dead, decaying flesh was reanimated and changed into glorified flesh, and Jesus walked out of that tomb. It's very important. I say it all the time. His feet made footprints in the sand. I say that to remind you, he was not a ghost. He was not a spirit. He was not a phantom. He was not ethereal. They touched him. They embraced him. He ate. He is physically alive. Many Christians today still don't understand the physicality of Jesus. Meaning, if I ask a Christian, you, a little test. For somebody that's not in the sanctuary, you meet another Christian. Is Jesus still a physical human being today? Nine times out of ten, you know what they'll say? No. This is how ignorant Christianity is today in America. Jesus, when he became flesh, took on human flesh for eternity. 
He is the first fruits of the resurrection, meaning he rose from the dead. He's physical. You could shake hands with Jesus. You can embrace him. And he hasn't aged a day. Jesus is still a physical man. He's God, always been God. He's God. But he's a physical man right now. Right now. 2,000 years later after the resurrection, he doesn't have one wrinkle or one gray hair. He hasn't aged a day. The resurrection. Now what I want to do this morning is to help us all realize why Easter is so amazing. Because it is amazing. It's cosmic. It changes the trajectory of all of creation. I'm not making that up. I'm not, that's not hyperbole. The resurrection of Jesus changes the trajectory of all of creation. It should impact you today. It should impact you the rest of your earthly life. And it should impact you for eternity. That's how important Easter is. All right. We begin with 1 Corinthians 15, 19. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. I've shared this story numerous times. I'm going to do it quickly just as a springboard into a bigger discussion. About 18, 19 years ago, I got invited to a clergy group with uh, clergy from different denominations. What they did was they would take the readings. You know how we have three readings every Sunday. They would take the readings. They would look at the readings, and each person each week would do a study on the reading, and then there would be some banter back and forth to try and help different clergy on the message they were going to give to their congregation. Follow? All right. It seems like a good idea. The setup was good. It was fine. But I got invited to the group, and at the group, I quickly found out that I was... Unique. Shocker. But <laughs> unique in a different kind of way. Because the clergy started to talk, and it, it became very apparent very quickly that they didn't believe in the miracles of the Bible. The study was on John 6. John 6, Jesus feeds the 5,000, and he mentions Moses giving manna from heaven. Uh, he mentions all this, and that he's the true bread from heaven. So the study was on John 6. Well, the clergy started to talk, and they said, Jesus didn't really miraculously feed 5,000 people. He just taught them how to share. Okay. And then when Jesus mentioned manna, the part of the study, another clergy person spoke to him and said, wow, it wasn't real bread from heaven. It was probably insect guano. And if you don't know what guano is, that's poop. So for 40 years, they ate poop, according to them. And they began to dismiss the miracles, and they thought that they were so intelligent Honestly, they were like so highfalutin, like this was somehow an elite way to look at the scriptures to explain away the miracles. First time at the group, you're supposed to just sit there and listen. I raised my hand. And I said, yeah? I said, well, I, I, know I'm no, I, I know I'm new to this group, but I got a question. If we believe that Jesus walked out of a tomb alive after he died. Feeding 5,000, walking on water, those are flea bites in comparison to that bad boy. Rising from the dead, that trumps all of them. So if, if Jesus can rise from the dead, why not just believe he fed 5,000? And a clergyman spoke up and goes, oh, almost like, oh, little boy. You know what I mean? He didn't really rise from the dead. That's just something that they told each other to give them hope in this life. So I said, oh, I'm the only Christian in this group. Now I know you don't really believe Jesus rose from the dead. These were all pastors of churches with people. It's a shocking thing. They almost directly quoted it. If in this life only we've hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be what? Pitied. But here's the thing. When you meet your Christian friends and brothers and sisters, they do, praise God, acknowledge, the great and majority of them, that Jesus physically rose from the dead. Amen. But they act 
as if that's not the most important aspect of their faith. That's how they act. And that's the problem. They act as if he didn't. And I'll tell you how we as American Christians act as if Jesus rising from the dead was not the most important aspect of our faith. We treat our faith as if God's primary objective, please hear me, his primary objective is in some way, shape, and form to make your life on this earth better. Do you know that that is a distinctly American worldview? As if Jesus' main goal, God's main goal for you, was to impact you positively while on this orb. And it's very successful. That's why famous preachers write books entitled How to Live Your Best Life What? Do you know how antithetical to the Christian faith that title is? How to Live Your Best Life Now. If you're living your best life now, that means you're going to hell. If you're living your best life now, you're going to hell. I will tell you when I'm going to live my best life. All right? But we treat as if Christianity's main focus is to bless you today. And that's why we have so many people that doubt. Because we're acting as if this isn't the highest festival of the church year. Jesus defeating death. We behave as if Christianity and Jesus came here to bless you while on this orb primarily. That's a lie. And that's uniquely American. If Easter only resonates with Americans the way they're living their life, then Easter is a sham. But Easter should be able to give hope to the Ukrainian, to the hungry and the poor, to the dispossessed. Make no mistake, the reason so many Americans doubt is because of how prosperous we are. We have time on our hands. The great majority of people on earth ain't got no time to watch those programs that you sit and watch. They don't have time to reflect on their hurts and on their this and on their that. They're too busy trying to stay alive. If you have a car and you live in a house by with your, just your immediate family and you have running water, you're the richest 2% of people on earth right now. And yet Americans doubt more than any other kind of Christians there are. And I want to tell you why. Because we're treating Christianity with our expectation of longevity and health. That's how we're treating Christianity. We're treating Christianity if it only has impact for what? This life. And if that's how you're treating Christianity, you are to be pitied more than most. See, if in this life... We hope in Christ we are of all most to be pity. We may not say, but we talk and we act as if Christianity's main purpose is somehow to impact me positively and bless me today. See, right now, while we are comfortably in this sanctuary, right now, 26 million people are in Shanghai right now. And you want to know what's happening in Shanghai? I'm not making this up. Go ahead and Google it. Look it. Look it up. All right? In Shanghai, 26 million people, the Communist Party of China has locked them in their apartment buildings. They cannot go outside. One person from each apartment building per day can go out and try and get food for the whole apartment complex. They are with robot dogs. I'm not making this up, man. It's crazy. Robot dogs and drones flying over Shanghai since late March, keeping people in their houses because they, the Chinese Communist Party has a zero COVID policy, meaning they are still trying to believe that they can stop a virus. So what they're doing is they're starving out and killing their people. There's videos from Shanghai of the people opening up the doors and windows screaming for freedom. Right now while we're here, we go to Dunkin' Donuts, we go to Mickey D's, we make our meals, and 26 million people 
are being locked in their apartment buildings in Shanghai. If Easter only makes sense to us, then Easter is a sham. Easter has to give hope to us, but Easter also has to, has to give hope what? To them. Right now in Ukraine, try giving those people the book, Live Your Best Life Now. Seriously. They're walking away. Their families are dead. They have, they're getting buried by a psychopath named Vladimir Putin. Try. Go up to him right now and go, Jesus Christ has a wonderful plan for your life. Oh, that'll give him some hope. Do you see how empty that sounds to a person that isn't us? The point here is very simple. Easter has to mean something to them, to those in Shanghai, and to you. It has to give hope to everyone, no matter what they're going through, no matter how sick they are, no matter what struggle they're in. Easter must mean something, and it does, and the reason we don't catch it, you know what's shocking to us? We still, no matter what we say, we don't expect death. Only in America do we have this weird expectation that we're all going to be healthy, live long, and die old. Do you know the rest of the world does not experience life that way? Do you know in India, 1.2 billion people, do you know 50% of the population is under 21? They are used to living, being surrounded by what? Death. They're used to it. Only in America does the death of a loved one cause you to doubt. That's how prosperous we are. Because it shocks our system. In the rest of the world, everybody is expecting what? Death. They live with that expectation. Only in America are we so blessed to say, I'm going to doubt God because someone died. The expectation of a sinful, disgusting world is what? Is death. Just to give you an inkling. You know, a million people in the past two years died either from or with COVID. I'm not going to get into that debate. Doesn't matter. Let's just say from. It's fine. Not fine. It's terrible. It's tragic. A million people are dead in America. Nine million people die a year from hunger or hunger-related issues. That has greatly increased because we locked everything down. They all died we didn't. But because we locked down, you know, those other people, they all died. Because we didn't feed them. So 9 million people die a year from hunger or hunger-related issues. 65 million people die every single year. Every single year, 65 million people die. 178,000 people die every single day. 178,000 people die every single day. 120 people die every minute. Every single minute on this globe, there's 120 people that die. That means in a about 75-minute service, which we're going to have, about 9,000 people on the globe will die while we're sitting here. Somewhere 9,000 people will die. Right now, while I'm talking, there will be death. All right. What that means... Oh, and then last but not least, or definitely not least, this is how deadly the world is. 73 million people are aborted a year. Now, I want you to look at the second line. 65 million people die of every single cause, cancer, heart disease, COVID, 65 million people die in a year. 73 million babies die every year. Abortion is not just the leading cause of death. The leading cause of death would mean it's the most. No, there are more abortions every year then there are any other causes of death, all of them combined every single year. Whether it's cancer, heart disease, whatever, 73 million babies die. That means you can double the rest of the statistics because those weren't included. All right. 
Now, here's another thing. This is how deadly this world is. 20, and I didn't include this, 23 million miscarriages, meaning those are intentional abortions. 23 million miscarriages happen a year. That's how regular death is. 23 million a year. Okay. We have to wrestle with this. People say, Pastor, why are you saying this? Because you won't understand. We can't understand Easter until we wrestle with that reality right there. How does Easter give hope if we don't wrestle with that reality? All right? We live in a world that is corrupted and we will die. Right now, I can look around the sanctuary. There are mothers that had stillborns, there are women who had abortions. There's forgiveness in Christ, by the way. Right now, there are people caring for their elderly parents. Right now, there's husbands and wives that you're caring for that are in terrible grief and pain. Try handing them the book. Live your best life now. Where's the hope? The hope is, first, wrestle with that reality. We live in a world of death. Death is tragic, it is painful, it is heartaching. That's why we as Americans don't want to face it. I, after I wrote, wrote this sermon, I was holding joy that night. My wife and I take turns uh, nightly reading stories to joy, and I was thinking what life would be like without my little, without little boo. And of course it brings a tear to your eye. It would be heartbreaking. But do you understand that I don't have the right to expect my child to live. You follow what I'm trying to say here? I don't have the right to expect it. This is a world filled with what? Death. That's why we doubt. We expect God to keep us all healthy, wealthy, and wise when we're in a world of death. That's the reality. So of course it's heartbreaking. Of course it's destructive. Of course it's horrible. That's why today is such a good day. Because Jesus beat this problem. He rose from the grave. He's alive. He defeated death. Death is real. The pain of sin is real. There is real tearing, real grief, real pain, real sadness. It's real. I want to share a scripture from... Hebrews. So, just as far as death being real. For as by a man came death, meaning Adam and Eve sinned, therefore sin brought what? Death. You're a sinner, therefore you should expect what? You, you want to, again, only, so ignorant. I'm not trying to be mean, it's just, Christians don't even understand that what they deserve is What? Death. If you die, you're getting what? What? What are you getting? What you deserve. Why would you be mad at God for giving you what? What you earned. You have no right to be mad with God. Anytime you're mad with God, you be wrong. That's right, I said you be. <laughs> Anytime you're mad with God, you are wrong. Anytime you are angry with God, you are sinning. Any, anytime you question God, you are faulty. You don't have the right. You don't. And living with this expectation of I'm going to be healthy, I'm going to be wealthy, I'm going to be wise. Look at, we now live in a world of what? If you're healthy, wealthy, and wise, that's called grace. You did nothing to earn it. You did nothing to get it. You just thank God for it. And if it ends, you certainly don't blame him for it because you did it to yourself. It's that simple. For as by a man came death, but then here's the good news. By a man has come what? Also the resurrection. For as in Adam, who's going to die? All. So also in Christ, all shall be made alive. What an amazing thing. What an amazing thing. We deserve death. Jesus takes death for us. And Jesus rises up again, and he's alive. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood... He, Jesus, himself, likewise partook of the same things, that through death 
he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong what? If you're afraid to die, you are a slave. If you are afraid to die, you are a slave. As a matter of fact, what I'll tell you is if you're afraid, you're a slave. Here's the beauty. That must be Jesus. Who is that? Amen. All right. <laughs> if you're a slave, if you are afraid, you're a slave. Fear has no place in the Christian heart. None. Because Jesus defeated everything that we are to be afraid of. If Jesus says, don't do A, and then you do A, what are you doing? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mary. You're the only one. Let's try it again. If Jesus says, don't do A, and then you do A, what are you doing? So when Jesus says, do not fear the one who can kill the body, and after that can do nothing. I'll tell you who to fear. Fear the one who can cast both body and soul into hell. If he's, if, therefore, if you are afraid to die, you are actively sinning. So where does it come from? It comes because we're so used to being okay. Basically, our prosperity and God's blessing has turned us into a bunch of weak, willy need doubters. It's crazy. All right? He took death. He took every swing death could give him, and then he rose from the dead. And he said, death no longer even has a bite. Because if you know Christ, your last breath here will be your first breath there, and he will take you from death to life. It's that simple. There is nothing this world can do to you anymore. Now, how does this message resonate with the Ukrainians? I know it's terrible. It's disgusting. This world is horrible. But there's a resurrection. This is not the end of the story. Your loved ones will rise again. How does it help those screaming in Shanghai because a bunch of communists are locking people in their home, treating them like ants. I'll tell you how it resonates with them. This is horrible. They are disgusting. The power structure in your country is sadistic, wicked, and evil. I agree with you. They will pay, and you will rise again. This is not your end. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you will rise again. Now that gives real, lasting what? Hope. That gives hope. This is not your whole life. You will rise again. As a matter of fact, here is a timeline. It's your timeline. I will not say where you are on that timeline, but this is your timeline. You were born. You will earthly die. Most of the time, you are worried about your existence in that timeline. I want you to understand something. God spends precious little time worried about your existence in that timeline. You want to know why he spends precious little time thinking about that timeline? Because he sees your life like this. I had to make it that far just so you could see. That's your whole earthly life right there, that little, that little bit right there. The rest of your life in heavenly glory. When God looks at your life, that's what he sees. That's what you need to see. Because of Easter. Because Jesus rose from the dead. So death is a flea bite. Seriously. Ain't nothing but a thing. That's a fact. To the Christian, death is nothing to be afraid of. Do you have any idea how liberating that should be for us? That doesn't mean, I don't have Kool-Aid up here that you all going to die, all right? That doesn't mean we hasten death. That doesn't mean we like death. As matter, what did I already say about death? What is it? It's tragic. It's terrible. It's heartbreaking. It's heart-wrenching. Okay? Got it. Understand. But there is the hope in Christ. There is the hope in Christ that everyone has. My brother, my best friend, died last year. Do you know if it wasn't for Jesus, what a tragic mess that would be? But I know that my brother knew Jesus Christ. Therefore, yeah. I need a new spades partner. <laughs> Ignore me, all right. 
I need a new space partner. I need somebody to laugh with. Got it. Understood. It's tragic and it's terrible. He's my only sibling. I miss my brother. I got it. But I'll tell you what I didn't do. When I got the phone call that my brother died and it was out of the blue, it wasn't some prolonged illness, I didn't spend time going, God! Why would I be mad at him? Because when my brother died, now this is going to sound harsh, he got precisely what? What he deserved. And then he's going to rise again and get the grace of God. It's that simple. So on that day that my brother died, Jesus Christ took him from death to life. And I will see my brother again. What an amazing thing. So, how does Easter impact me today? Yes, there is death, but there is a resurrection. Yes, there is war, but there is a resurrection. Yes, there is sickness, but there is a resurrection. See, it's only because we live in such a protective bubble that we have not been forced to deal with what? With death. But it's real, and it's coming for you. But you don't have to be afraid of it. Because today happened, and Jesus is alive. And it means the same thing to a Christian in India, in Shanghai, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Canada, in America, all around the world. They're saying Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Death no longer holds us. It no longer has a sting. That's the hope of Easter. So knowing that there is a resurrected Christ and therefore knowing I too will rise again and live on a new heaven and a new earth forever. That's what we know because of, because of today. What that does is it frees me from fear today. What can the world do to me? You know the worst thing the world can do to you is send you to heaven? <laughs> the worst thing the world can do to you is send you to heaven. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's the worst thing you can do. Send me to heaven. When you look at it that way, all of a sudden, death what? Loses its sting. It's the worst thing they can do. Send me to heaven. Okay, yeah, I get to go to heaven. My bad. All right, so being free, that's what I'm saying. That's freedom. What can the world do to me? It can send me to heaven. What that does is frees me to love the day. You want to know why this world has gotten so unloving? Because it's gotten so selfish. Everybody is trying to protect themselves. Nobody is trying to protect their neighbor. And why is everybody trying to protect themselves? Because everybody's afraid. And what are they afraid of? They're afraid of death, which is going to happen. Which is why today is so great. So you're set free from that fear. Once you know that you are completely wholeheartedly taken care of, you now can begin to concern yourself with who? Your neighbor. That's what the resurrection does. I've shared this before. I know some of you have seen it. I, I, must, I said, nah, I'm not going to do this again today. But you know what? I'm the preacher, so you're going to have to sit through it. Uh, I'm in charge. That's right. <laughs> A captive audience. My, I love, I love my parents' tombstone. Uh, my mother is still alive, uh, but my father died. My father died, uh, he had early onset Alzheimer's when he was 61, died when he was 67. And uh, um, my father had a saying, and many people in the congregation know the saying, he never went to the doctor. This could be a testimony to my mother's way of thinking, but nevertheless, he never went to the doctor. Whenever anything would be wrong, my, my father would just say, I've had that, it goes away. That was my father saying, I've had that, it goes away. So whenever anybody would complain to my dad about being sick, oh, this hurts, I've heard this. Shh, shh, shh. Chris, I've had that, it goes away. Uh, that was my father's famous saying. My mother, who is still alive, by the way, 
since I was born, has been sick with every conceivable disease on planet Earth, all right? Uh, I can remember as a teenager opening up the Reader's Digest and going over all the symptoms of the diseases without telling my mother that I was doing that. Like, do you have this? Hey, Mom, do you have this? I got that. Do you have this? Oh, yeah, I got that. Do you have this? Yeah, I definitely got that. Do you have this? I got that. She has every disease on Earth. Ah, so uh, my mother, from the time I was born, has been sick. Okay, She'll laugh about this, by the way. She's watching. She's laughing. Right now she's laughing. Don't worry. You're all like, Burr. you don't know my family. I'm telling you. She's fine. There's been a bunch of, play, a bunch of times when people are like, is your mom going to be bad? No. Uh, she's fine. Uh, all right. <laughs> and so, uh, my, so when my dad died, my brother and I, and my mother was involved, my mother was involved too. All right. Uh, we, we made a headstone, and so, so what will often happen is you make a headstone for both parents, okay? Even though mom is still alive, the headstone covers both plots, right? So my mother is on the left, even though the, she has a beginning date but not an end date because she's still alive. And then there is my dad, and then he has when he was born and he died, and over there. All right, so this is the headstone. It says, Ag, that's my last name. You can't read it, so I put it there. It says Patricia A, and then underneath it says C, comma, I told you I was sick. Ah, uh, that's where my mom will go, all right? Ah, uh, that's where my mother will go. But my father's says, uh, I've had that, it goes away. Ah, uh, all right. It is a perfect gospel presentation. All right? So my mother's headstone says, see, I told you I was sick, she did. That's right, you sick. But then my father gets the last word. He always got the last word. He looks at his mom and says, I've had this. What? That's the point. That's the point. That's what Easter does. Jesus is alive. And if you cling to him, he's had this. What? It goes away. God is good. All the time. <laughs> All the time. Is Father, we thank you. You're a good, a holy an awesome and a gracious God. Jesus, we thank you for rising from the dead. We thank you for de defeating this world, which is dark and dim and cruel. But you are a good, gracious, and forgiving God, and we give you the glory. In the name of Jesus, amen.